Ryan, got a minute? Sure, come on in. Thanks. How are things going? Oh, not too bad. Good. You know, I was thinking the other day that uh, you've been with us now for a little over a year, and you're doing a great job. I want you to understand, Eric. We don't have any problems there. But uh, I was thinking back when I was starting out my career, and I knew there were things that kept me awake at night just by the sheer enormity of all of the challenges that you face. And I thought, well, maybe I ought to just sit down with you for a few minutes and see what's keeping you awake at night. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, while the industry does have nearly unlimited upside potential, uh, it is very challenging. I agree. And, you know, it's never going to not be challenging. You're never going to reach the point where you know everything. You figure, like, well, if I've been in the industry 20, 30, 35 years, shouldn't I have all the answers? No, you'll never have all the answers because of the changes that take place so fast. So you're always going to be challenged. Well, you've been in the industry for quite a while. Um, I've got some questions I'd like to run by if you have half the time. Sure. That's what I'm here for. All right. Well, I've been thinking about going back to graduate school. Uh, do you have any suggestions on that? What's your, what's your thoughts? Uh, you know, I do have some ideas. I think you have two choices. But before I go into the choices, I would say that people come into this industry with backgrounds in the damnedest things. I mean, I know guys who are very successful developers. Their undergraduate degree is English or fine arts or music or something along those lines. And you think, how'd they get into development? They got into development because regardless of the degrees, they have active, creative minds. They have a high level of risk aversion. And uh, basically, they like the challenge. But to get to your question, I think there are two options available to you. The first is you go back and you enroll in an MBA program. Master of Business Administration with a concentration in real estate. Now, what that's going to offer you is a lot of traditional business courses that you get in an undergraduate business curriculum, but at a somewhat higher level, and a few courses in real estate development. That's okay if you're not sure real estate development's for you. If you're thinking, well, I might go into some other industry at some point in my career, maybe the general degree would be better. On the other hand, if you're committed to real estate development as a career, then you probably want to look at programs that are Master of Science programs in real estate development. Every course offered in the MS in real estate development is in real estate development. There aren't any courses in traditional business uh, curriculums. So I would suggest that you make the decision, am I committed to a career in real estate development? And if so, look at the programs that are available uh, as a master of science. Well, if I went back to school, what should my entry-level expectations be? That's a great question. I don't know that there's a hard, fast answer, and that bothers a lot of people. You know, can't you just give me a yes or no? <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, you can't do something like that, but I can tell you what is a typical career path. And I, I think you're on it right now. But coming out of uh, graduate school, let's say with a Master of Science in Real Estate Development, you would probably be looking at a uh, position as an assistant project manager, maybe even project manager, but usually you've got to have a couple of years under your belt in the real world for that to happen. But an assistant project manager position is, uh, I think, the logical next step coming out of graduate school. Well, what's the best way to enhance my career? Two things come to my mind. Seems like everything happens in twos anymore, doesn't it? Um, I think one of the biggest things you could do for your career is networking. Mm -hmm. Networking means moving with the right people in the right places at the right time. In other words, if real estate development's your career, anybody that's involved in real estate development, you know, get them on your uh, LinkedIn or Twitter list or whatever, you know, Facebook, or whatever, you know, make them your friends, your pals. Spend time with them, talk to them. Uh, this is not just real estate developers, but everybody that's involved in this business, lenders, uh, the public sector, the uh, planning staff, people in the various um, consulting side of, of consultancies of real estate development, planners, engineers, architects, etc. You'll learn something from every one of those people, and you'll hear things. They'll tell you about career opportunities that are coming up that maybe don't apply to them, but might be just down your alley. The second thing I'd suggest you do is get involved in your choice of professional organizations in the real estate development industry. There are a bunch of them, but I'd say that among the best, the Urban Land Institute, otherwise known as ULI, that's a big tent. And everybody that's involved in real estate development has uh, usually has a membership in that. Then if you're going to specialize in, let's say, uh, office and industrial properties, there's an organization called NAOP. The National Association of Industrial and Office Properties. There's uh, another organization that specializes in retail, ICSC, International Council of Shopping Centers. So once you've kind of begun to focus on where you're going to go, 
in your career? What direction, what type of development you're going to do? Pick one or two of these organizations. Don't just join them. Paying your dues doesn't get you anything except a magazine every month, which you may or may not enjoy reading. But uh, it gives you access to their meetings, their programs, your fellow members. Serve on committees. Get involved at the grassroots level. That's another form of networking, and it's invaluable. The two most important things I did in my career, I joined the Urban Land Institute and got very actively involved in it and still am. And I had a mentor, somebody that had been a veteran of the industry and took me under his wing at an early age and basically taught me a lot of things. And it's crazy what sticks in your mind, but I can remember the first time we went through a house, uh, one of the model homes that was being built in our subdivision we were developing, he walked in the bathroom and knocked on the tub in the guest bath, and I thought, what in the hell is he doing? And so I asked him, and he said, you can tell by the quality of the tub, the quality of the house and the builder's uh, pension for putting quality in. He said, this is a fiberglass tub. He said, but this house, this was back in the day now, I said, but this house is almost a million dollars. He said, you would have expected a better quality tub. And another thing he did was he lifted the lid off of the toilet and looked underneath the lid to see who had made it and when it had been made. Did this guy buy Army Navy surplus? It's 20 years old, or was it good stuff? I mean, just a lot of things you learn from people in the industry that take you years on your own to find. In addition to being the actual developer, what are some of the other professions in the real estate development process? Well, that's a good question. Uh, think about the process itself. What are the different stage, stages or phases of the uh, process? And who's involved in those stages? Well. You start off uh, early on with market analysts, and uh, then when you get into the site selection part of it, you've got all kinds of consultants, um, engineers, geotechs, environmental specialists. You get into the entitlement end of things. You've got people from the planning side of things, uh, land use attorneys. Um, moving from there into design, you've got urban planners, architects, uh, general contractors, ultimately property managers and asset managers, salespeople, brokers. I mean, there's a lot of folks, lenders, investors. A lot of people make their living off this industry without having to take the risks that the developer takes. So it's a big ten. Well, are they useful from a cost-benefit perspective? Well, it's good to think in terms of cost-benefit, no matter what you're doing. As I said earlier, if you join an organization, let's say you join uh, the Urban Land Institute, and I can't off the top of my head tell you what their annual dues are for full membership, but full membership, of course, brings more benefits than any of the other forms of membership. But it isn't inexpensive in the sense that it's going to cost you somewhere north of $1,000, probably north of $1,200. And if you pay that money and you don't do anything except get that monthly magazine, you're not, it's not cost-benefit effective. If you join and you become actively involved in the Urban Land Institute, both at the grassroots level, which they call district councils, which is local, as well as at the national level by joining one of the national councils that deals with a specific product type, might be mixed-use development, might be residential, um, now you're getting your bang for your buck. So the answer to your question is it can be cost-benefit effective if you use it in the right way. 